Welcome back everyone on theCUBE's live coverage here at Databricks Data and AI Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We got the CUBE top research analyst here with me, Rob Stretchy, George Gilbert, to break down from theCUBE research a wrap up and summary of the show and Databricks' position in the market. This is a deep dive analyst segment. Uh, guys, great to see you again. We did the keynote review this morning on day two. It was te more technical than yesterday, but even more technical, both technical. Um, yeah, Databricks looking good. I mean, they're making a big bet. The bet's pretty clear. Open, open data, open formats, open source, and I believe that they're betting that the builders of the new infrastructure around data engineering will come from the bottom up versus top down. Um, so, what's your analysis, guys? Give us your Databricks analysis of the show and yeah. position in the market. They move the needle? Did I, they? I, I think they did, and I, I think again, they proved why, and I, I think one of the things that stood out on the open side today was that over 66% of the contributions to Spark are coming from outside of Databricks these days. When you look at the health of a community, the health of a, you know, that bottoms up type of thing, that kind of shows that if they can get that to happen with Unity, uh, while well, they've open sourced Unity Catalog and they can get some other momentum around that, I, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's, I don't know if it's game over, but it definitely puts them in a really pole position. We had Tony Bear on earlier, the analyst uh, on our Cube Collective segment. He brought up that the fact that what's interesting to him was, to your point, Databricks has controlled most of the open source projects that have been to date, Spark and others. And so now you're starting to see them bring that out, but yet the, it's not yet a done deal, Rob. They still got to execute. Absolutely. The, what I call post Databricks gravity around the projects. Uh, and then buying <laughs> the $2 billion to get Iceberg, again, that's again, more Databricks. So I, I, it might be a feature, not a bug. I mean, I like what they're doing with, with, with the, they're forcing the market, saying, hey, Iceberg may not get it, George. You talk to the founders of Iceberg. The formats are different. That bridge might not have been built. But if we can accelerate that with $2 billion in acquisition and put more money behind it, I mean, so Databricks making moves. So, so let me try an angle where, like, start with the perspective of what, what customers are trying to do and then how the vendors are jockeying for position to sort of push others out of the way and get in front of the customer in, in terms of their priorities. So they're all building a data platform where they want an analytic data estate that is, that they can use for all when these- When you say they, the customers, customers or the vendors? I'm sorry, okay, the customers. customers. All these uh, artifacts, like, their, their pipelines, their BI dashboards, their machine learning models, um, their, their Gen AI uh, pipelines and, and applications, and then you know, activating this data, like um, uh, essentially operating, operationalizing the insights. So that's, that's sort of an intermediate term goal for the customer. And now l let me take one slight detour, which is Databricks is acting very much like Microsoft used to do, which is Microsoft, they want to own a platform, and to control the platform, they want as many, they want as many um, sort of sockets out there as possible. And if, if it means they open up the platform to get partners to like, validate their, their sockets, to, to plug in, even if it competes with their, um, their own products that are on that platform. The point of this digression is that Right now, the platform is an open table format, and they want Microsoft partner closely with Databricks to get all this Delta formatted data on Microsoft Azure. Then the next layer above that is, how do you define that and govern that? That's the catalog layer. And so, what was a, such a big deal today was to see Unity, which is a comprehensive operational and business catalog. It's, their aspiration is to govern your entire data estate. The, the point of this soliloquy is that by open sourcing it, they're, they're, Databricks is saying, forget the data format now. We, we, we've got that covered. You won't have to care. The new platform is the catalog. And, and Microsoft is kind of weak there, and the Snowflake catalog is tied to their compute engine. So they're trying to get everyone to plug in because once you plug in all your tools, the functionality of your tools depends on what's in the catalog. So, so it's a strategic yes. game here, too. Yes. If, so you're saying, if I read what you're saying, just correct me if I'm wrong, 
if Databricks can force Snowflake to unplug compute from their data, advantage Databricks, or at least Snowflake's on a defensive position yeah. or not yeah. in their core. Rob, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, and I, I think they're, that they're taking an offensive strategic bet on plugging in through Unity Catalog and Delta Sharing that you can even go and read data out of Snowflake using and then share it using Delta Sharing. And I think that was one of the things yeah. that came up in one of the things is that there's almost a back door into getting into actually Snowflake and even the way that Snowflake, and I had this conversation with an, another uh, partner of both of them earlier and they said, one of the funniest things is that Iceberg's a wonderful way to migrate off of, off of Snowflake. They said because you can't really update into it, but you can read out really efficiently. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that if, if Snowflake doesn't really go and embrace and go down, and I, I think they're fighting two different wars strategically. And I think it's the Sun Tzu, you know, a thousand surround. centurions. Yes. Um, I know that strategy well. We, we, we have a lot of CUBE fans out there that I like that. But, but I want to get your thoughts on that because the data formats, you got the uniform, the okay, general availability, that's a big step forward. Huge. They shipped that from last year. Unity Catalog, now open source, but yet positioned to be whatever you want it to be with intelligence. Mosaic AI is like I call the toolbox. Build your AI app with that. Lake Flow, and now you got serverless. So all new things. Let, let me, let me um, circle back just to qualify two things. One on the sharing that Rob talked about, it goes through Unity. And so, what the, and, but to be fair to Snowflake, the sharing that Snowflake does when you're in the same region, you're on their cluster, right. which means you can do real time high, like low latency, high throughput yeah. sharing without making a copy. That's unique. Now, with, with, with um, Databricks, you can do an open protocol, so you don't have to have Databricks, you don't have to have Snowflake. Any, it's sort of any to any, just to be, to be clear on that. And also to be clear on the table format, right now, the reason, um, the reason Databricks bought um, Tabular is you cannot read and write arbitrarily in Delta or Iceberg or Hootie. You write in, in Delta, and then you can read in, in Hootie, and you can read in Iceberg. Which, right. to be fair, is where you are with, with Snowflake. You write in Iceberg uh, Managed, right. and then you can read it externally. The point is, though, Databricks, when Databricks will not require their compute engine, just a little executable to, to read and write. Yes. All he said, made the best compute win. Best yes, engine exactly. win, he didn't say compute, he said engine implying yeah. compute. Well I guess the question is backing up for customers now, where is the customer, because we got the conjecture from Databricks, and you got to love the narrative, I mean I, I like their story, I really do. Now let's talk about the reality of where customers are, what they, what they know or don't know, are they, what, what's their orientation? Are they actually looking at, the, are they in the weeds around the reads and the writes and who's got what? What's the take on the customer? What do you guys find yeah, in the customer? I, I mean, I think again, we got to talk to and, you know, Unilever, T-Mobile, and JPMC uh, payments yesterday, plus you had uh, Texas Rangers and uh, Alexander Booth on stage today. We'll later, you know, we'll have Jamail uh, Brown who's really out there in the field with those folks. I, I think when you start to talk to all of these people and all of these different, and I talked to a few at one of the uh, events the other night, you start to look at it, they're, they're looking for simplification. In fact, we were talking to Coastal, uh, Community, Coastal Bank. Community Bank yesterday, and her, you know, her entire thing was, I'm using serverless because I want it to turn on and be simple and just, I don't want to be managing the clusters, I don't want to be all those knobs. I think there's, this is where Snowflake has always done such a wonderful job, is been ease of use, and I think Databricks really put a stake in the ground that we're going to make it easy to use, and I think this is the coming out party for that, for people who are looking for an instant on type of uh, scenario. But, when you looked at Alexander Booth's diagram, earlier today from the stage, you know, he still had, you know, work, you know, Delta Live tables, but he used Astronomer, he's using uh, Airflow, he's using Lambda to actually do some processing, and then also Invent, EventBridge to actually be farming it out from an Amazon perspective. So when you start to look at how people have these pipelines built, that's not all going to go away just because of what has been announced. I think what they've made it simpler is to bring the data in with 
like lake flow and things of that nature. But it, it's, I think they have put a target on simplification. And Databricks has said, we, we, you know, we're winning the war in the AI, and they talked about you know, 200,000 uh, you know, models running on, on Databricks, which aren't all just Gen AI. So you're, saying, AI the, you're saying their strategy is to keep their beachhead on the enterprise accounts and slowly get stuff sucked into their lake. Yes. Over time, based upon their own ability to execute. Yeah, and I, I think again, they're, they're looking at it that if standpoint. you look at the 7,000, uh, the overlap of the 7,000 accounts using Databricks SQL and using you know, Delta Lake, it's really a high overlap between their core people because they're expanding their use, saying, hey, I'm already using Databricks for this, why don't I give this a shot? And that, that, was, that, that was the first beachhead for them. All right guys, George, we'll start with you. Next question, where is Databricks doing extremely well where they have an advantage, and what are their areas that need to work on? Okay. And then Rob, take the same question to you. So the, the, the thing where I was wrong last year, before Data and AI Summit, I was like, Gen AI is going to be a disruption. This company made its name on data engineering and feature engineering for machine learning. And what they did spectacularly well was they, and, and I should say also ML Ops. Yeah. The, the, you know, operating the models, the artifacts that you created. What they did really well was they expanded the definitions for those personas so that they were able to not just do the, the statistical shallow learning models and the feature engineering for that, but they made that into the, the same tool chain that does the chunking for the, for the embeddings, for the vector embeddings, and then they extended the ML engineer so that they're not just monitoring, you know, these the statistical machine learning models, but the generative models as well. So that's how they harnessed the huge wave of energy. And then so you see Snowflake trying also to extend their personas, the data analyst, the business analyst, um, and the data engineer with um, Gen AI functionality. But I think it, it, it happened more naturally um, on the Databricks side. And yeah. they did it first. Rob, where, where is Databricks winning? I, I think they're winning in the people who like to code. And I, I think they've always long been doing that. And I yeah. think a lot of the data engineering persona still likes to do that. They still like building their models in DBT and bringing that. And I think making it easier to bring things like DBT models that is really around SQL and things, those types of models. Uh, also really focused on a single, you know, single source of truth for the data. And making it easy to land the data there even if it's copies and not, you know, again, not necessarily uh, single source, but I think what they're looking at is they understand that the data has gravity, we're not going to fight that fight about where the data lives, what you can be in your account, longer term it could be in the Databricks account, and we'll see how that works out, but they're not, that's not their fight. Their fight is we're going to have the best compute engine, the best execution engine, and best catalog, to really bring the metadata to impact on top of that data. And I, I think that's where they've, you know, that's their North Star right now, and I think that's where they're executing. As you analyze Databricks now in context of the market forces, how would you give them, what grade would you give them? Well positioned, accelerating? You mentioned some ETR data on the, yeah. on the other segment. Um, I mean, they seem to be pumping on all cylinders. They're, they're accelerating. I mean, both them and Snowflake are accelerating. Uh, I would say that the rate of acceleration is higher uh, for Databricks, and again, I think you know, depending on the numbers and how you calculate them, it may be off a slightly lower number. But it's not. I, I think they're they're neck and neck at this yeah. point. And I think the acceleration, though, has been over the past year looking at the ETR data in accounts that were shared. And we talked about this a lot that it was like a 50-50 split. They're still accelerating in those accounts. In fact, you know, their actual uh, perception and actual, uh, the percent change has grown yeah. in those accounts. Yeah. And we've heard, we've heard on, on SiliconANGLE and also the Cube Research, budgets are bifurcating around Gen AI and old legacy operating stuff, so budgets aren't being actively approved or enhanced on the old school side, so they have to make a business case. And so the question is, where's the line between old school data analytics, legacy, and generative AI expansionary. That's that, going to be the question, and I think to me, yeah. 
you, there's a little gray area there. I mean, you could look at some analytics and say, oh, that's generative AI, but it's bolt-on, it's not engineered. But so what's your guys' angle on that? So, so let, let me take that one first, because I have strong opinions Go. on this. Go, Which is that um, Gen AI is not, um, it's not an application. Gen AI is like an operating system, and the capabilities need to be embedded in other tools and applications. And the, the, the first killer app, besides customer service, because that's such a no-brainer to yeah. synthesize like knowledge base and help, help an agent, but the killer application is to infuse it in every stage of the software development life cycle, including the data life cycle. And so it'll make the data scientists more productive, but the one that everyone's showing here is when you put the metric layer in, it's easy then to talk to your data because it, it understands your business terminology, bookings, billings, and backlog, you know, at, for your company. But you need that metric layer, and that they, they put in, I don't know the, the details yet of how they implemented it. Um, but it's but smart. They're, but they're, they're, they're ahead of Snowflake right now in making it easy to define those, yeah. those metrics, because, and you need that for the, biz, the end user to talk to their data. Yeah, and I think they also know that, just building off of what George is talking about, on the metrics layer, I think they also know that it's really about the ecosystem because they're still, and they, they kind of laughed about, you know, this is the DuckDB, how, how are we going to send things between DuckDB and uh, Spark? Well, we're going to use CSV files. There is still a crap ton, yeah. and that's a technical term, of <laughs> CSV files and Excel spreadsheets that have data in them. That's not something that they're really tackling right now. I mean, even yeah. with the lake flow stuff, they're looking at the semantic layer folks as being part of the answer and how do you model that data in because defining revenue for a company becomes, it's part of that data product. And I think we actually got into some discussions yesterday that talked about where we talk about the intelligent data apps and yeah. data products and how do you build data features. And I think they're really starting to look at how do we bring all of those pieces together. And if you take what you guys are talking about and infuse Gen AI or data capabilities into the, into the every step of the value chain, you got to have a data intelligent platform. I mean, so the point is, the money will go towards that. So if it's not a holistically engineered or reset piece, I think Databricks is betting the ranch that that will happen. They're, I mean, that you said it, the data intelligence platform, they're trying to say, look, you want to do Gen AI or, or any other analytics, you need to define your data. And it's not about what's built into the model, the frontier models, it's about how you define yeah. your data, also yeah. with small models, yeah. because the performance is, the performance is in how you define and, and organize yeah. your data, that's everything. I mean, you mentioned operating systems earlier on stage today, Ali used the word kernel. Yeah. in Unity, so they're already building in capabilities to make things easier yeah. under the covers, yeah. right. which is like, okay, we'll help this go along. So yeah. I think Databricks has got the secret plan, this might be conspiracy theory, but <laughs> to be the AI operating system, okay, for anything involved in AI, because if they can own that layer with the intelligent platform, all they got to do is make it easier and reduce the steps and make that wiring of formatting and all those in, in the weeds details go away. Yeah. Who cares if it's gone? They're, they're, it's funny you should say that because I, I talked to Naveen on, on background a couple weeks ago um, on, on a separate project and he was like, that's their vision is to have the tool chain that lets you fine tune, um, you know, train or, or fine tune and serve it doesn't have to be DBRX, yeah. their model. It's yeah. any collection of models. Sounds like it's not on background anymore, but that, we'll take it. Thanks, George, for contributing yeah. that little <laughs> nugget from the yeah, But they also, <laughs> they also looked at, if you look at what models they were showing off, it was, it was Meta, yeah. it was yeah. you know, Llama 3, it was GPT-2, you know, when, and, and I think part of it is they're not, they're not all set. In fact, they, they talked about it with Jensen yesterday, how they're going to be able to be part of NIMS and bring yeah. that stuff there. I, I think it all totally makes sense for where they're going to your point of being that layer above and try to really harness and be the place that people go to do the fine tuning. 
I know you guys got to go to another analyst thing, go get sequester, get some more data for us. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on. Final word, guys, I want you to uh, share what you're looking at post-event now. What are you going to be putting on your agenda? Where are you going to be, what dirt are you going to be digging up? What are you going to be focused on as you start analyzing and, and talking to customers? What's the next, you know, uh, North Star, or next 20 mile stair, if you will, for your research? Rob, yeah. we'll start with yeah. you. So, I'm looking at it going, okay, how does this simplify the organization's life? How do they really embrace these features and what's the uptick on the features? They've had great uptick on Delta Lake and Data, uh, Databricks SQL. Okay, great, so with these new ones that have been announced, how many are using Lakeflow, how many are moving into Unity, mm -hmm. how many, what, what's being done with Unity open source? Uh, I, I think I've heard a couple people saying, hey, this may be an on-ramp for people who are looking to get into Databricks that might not be there yet today. Uh, so how easy is it yeah. to make that transition? I think these things and digging into that, we're going to continue digging into this metadata because the metadata is really where the war is going to be won. And I, I think that that is definitely big on our agenda. And I would build on what Rob said and, and say there's, there's two things that I think over the next 12 months, um, we're going to hear like nonstop about yeah. agents because that's really LLM's V2. Now, yeah. let's be clear, yeah. there's going to be a lot yeah. of fairy dust sprinkled on this, but... What's a legit application? A legit ac application is, it's an, an agent is something that doesn't just respond to you, that it does work on your behalf. Now, it's not autonomous, you have yeah. to supervise it, it makes yeah. mistakes, but to do that, it needs to understand the data beyond just bookings, billings, and revenue. It needs a semantic harmonization so it knows yeah who are the people, places, things, and activities. Those are the two things. And I think that reinforces our, our thesis that a structural change will have to happen to make that happen. Yeah. You can't just rebolt and re-whitewash the old data architecture. I'm looking forward with the Cube Research, for my focus is, I'm looking for the disruptive enabler because to make that happen, there has to be one thing that's going to enable that. Is it the unified catalog? Is it something that's a horizontally scalable data layer? Is it real time? There's a lot going on under the hood that we might not care about, just a hard top. Uh, go, go for it, Databricks. But what's going to be the enabler? Cuberesearch.com, check out all the coverage there. These guys are digging. They're turning over the dirt. They're finding all the jewels and the industry. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break.